the response we got from the government was, nobody in that area voted for the president. <laughs> Which I used to think was funny. <laughs> now I don't. <laughs> That's funny. I, I think that could happen. But they, he, wouldn't, he didn't want to evacuate him because they weren't people who voted for him. <laughs> That's pretty cool. <laughs> and so, the real man of some of the people. Yeah, I know that. <laughs> he had his base and he, he, he knew who they were. So, protective equipment, we had to get our chemical warfare gear out because we didn't have enough bee suits. We, we bought out all the bee suits. We bought every one of the P100 masks that 3M had in stock to just get masks to go around. But there was nothing. So, we, we had our chemical warfare stuff flown in, which really looks kind of like you know, World War III is coming right now. What we we had to do is is find a way to is find a way to surveil this. We had to monitor what was going on because we needed to know if this toxic stuff was coming to the airport so we could get people inside and get them out of the way. Yeah. So with all of the gas and stuff going everywhere, it was like acid rain a thing? It was acid acid clouds. There were actually acid clouds that would roll over the cloud. Just come kill it killed the weeds, but it was it was nasty, but we just had to run, you know, run inside before it to go away. So we had to figure out there. There are chemical detectors. You know, there are detectors. For stuff. Well, military chemical warfare. There's some detectors, right? All that stuff. There's there's a vehicle called a Fox that actually is a chemical detector. Well, first of all, he wouldn't allow us to bring in a Fox chemical warfare vehicle because he wouldn't allow that on as well. And so on. so we said, oh, okay. And we we had trouble getting a C5. In there. We said, well, we, we will use some of the detector equipment we have. What do we have? We call the Chemical Warfare Center. And, and they said, well, we got lots of things. We can detect, you know, we can detect sarin gas, and we can detect, oh, I said, well, we're not, that's not, we just need acid clouds and phosgene and a couple of, we don't, we don't have any of those. The military had absolutely no way to detect any of the threats that were blowing down the window. It's because they are not recognized chemical agents. Right, there's, there are chemical agents. There's a list of chemical agents that you use in warfare that have been weaponized. And there are detectors for all of those. None of this stuff is weaponized. This is just stuff. You know, I, chloric acid and sulfuric acid gas clouds, nobody's used those in warfare. So there's no, there's, there's no detector there. Yeah. That's a good idea. So it's kind of cool. So what I ended up doing was, was, going, was going on the web, and I found a commercial detector for these things. Now they had only one available that was portable, ran on battery, because electricity is kind of hard to come by at the other end of the airport, you know, at the, at the end of the runway, but there, there's no outlet. <laughs> <laughs> so I got battery powered one. But it doesn't, it didn't have any Wi-Fi tape, it didn't have anything, except it went off and went ee when there was an acid cloud, and you know, that's, it went off. So you have to have Somebody's in and in and right? So this is the military. That you, this is the army. The army actually has procedures for this. So we took the youngest private. <laughs> because that's what you do. Youngest guy dies first. It's like if you're in the woods and you're starving and you, you want to know if these mushrooms are okay, you give it to the youngest private. And, and if he dies, you don't eat it. And, <laughs> and if he lives, everybody eats. So, we gave him a folding chaise lounge, a folding chaise lounge, a walkie-talkie, and the detector, and a book. And so we, we sent him out to the end of the runway. He, he gets into his chaise lounge and his walkie-talkie and he's reading his book. And if it goes off, his job is to say, "Oh my God, it's coming!" and and then bring all of it back in as he's running away from. Me. Don't forget your chair. The chair and the book. He's the chair and book and radio. So this and the detector. <laughs> it gives you great confidence in the government to know that that was my best plan. <laughs> so, one, so one guy had to lug all that back. He's just, private. He's just he's a private soldier. I don't know if they at least gave him a car and a drive back, but <laughs> no, then he'd no. have to run down the runway. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have any cars. That's for. <laughs> Venezuela. You know, we so what or a bike. He died five days later after eating a poisonous mushroom. He's just dead. What are you doing? I mean, like, well, what if you're going to get that first thing? You guys will eat it. Oh, if he dies, if he dies later, well, that, you know, you do that whole thing with—is your tongue burning and all of the usual stuff? There's a procedure. Yeah, there's a whole, there's a whole <laughs> series of you take that. You know, there's a size that you bite, 
and then you wait five minutes and you do it. I mean, there's, there's a whole little series of things you do to test. Probably an acronym yeah, for that procedure too. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. So they take a while. Probably be a lot of stairs. So it's good to be private. You can die. <laughs> you, you can die. Become a corporal as fast as you can. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't, don't be the only private there. Don't exactly. be the youngest. Just, it's exactly the same situation from Galaxy Quest. You guys all watch Galaxy Quest? Nope. Oh my god, I think my education sucks. <laughs> what is the matter with your education? At least one of us has. Okay. It's I called, wreck. I'm gonna die, I don't have a last name. It, it's, it's a Star Trek strip yeah. and it just says, I, I'm gonna die if you take me down to the planet, because I don't have a last name. Yeah. It's every Star Trek episode, if you brought somebody down and didn't have a last name, they died. <laughs> it was kind of neat, so this is what happens. And we also had to worry about, you know, this was a whole, this was a whole problem with exposures. I had 110 people on the ground, all of whom could have been exposed at least minimally to stuff. So we had to come up with ways to say, were you exposed, and take blood samples, and take out, and we had to do a whole bunch of stuff. That their blood is still solidly frozen in, in, in Maryland. And it, it was documented, so like, we have blood from all these people who are there. Just in case anything happens to them, we can actually go back and test with better tests than we had at the time. So that's kind of cool, but that's, that's one of the things we had to do. And sell that. To the Joint Chiefs, they weren't sure they wanted to do that. I did. So here it was kind of neat. Here's the fire suppression was the other thing. We we wanted to bring in our equipment to do fire suppression. You know the sprinklers and alarms and all that stuff. Well, they didn't want anybody who wasn't medical. They, they and the Cubans were welcomed in. And the Cubans brought a brigade. If you think of a military brigade, the Cuban brigade has eight people. It's a brigade. It's a Cuban brigade. They're sending a Cuban brigade of help. There were eight people. Isn't the brigade like thousands? Three thousand. Three thousand. Yeah, three thousand people in the U.S. They, they sent eight. That was Cuban brigade, and they got headlines. Cuban brigade arrives to help. It's like, oh yeah, I, I know all their names. <laughs> 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 Hope we had picture. to get PAHO to go to World Health to go to UN to get the Swedes and the Germans to come in with detection and fire suppression equipment because he would accept people that didn't have any interactions with him. And so we had to get the Swedes and the Germans to bring in the monitoring equipment and bring in the fire suppression stuff so that the stuff wouldn't keep going off. They had to keep the nitrocellulose wet. And they disposed of the toxic material but never told anyone what they did. With. We have no idea what happened. We do know that the, the, the minister of, in charge of customs was relieved of his duties um, because it appears all of this stuff, which was not any manifest anywhere, is all involved in, in cocaine manufacture and he was transshipping stuff. Oh. This is nice. all cocaine processing stuff. <laughs> all that toxic chemical is part of they're all They're all part of making cocaine out of uh, cocaine. Oh. So this is this was cool. a huge supply <laughs> depot for people making cocaine. So I think you know. See, that's something cool to learn. <laughs> so so, if you, you hear or read about meth labs that explode because somebody gets careless and they blow up a trailer, this is like a meth Stop lab the size of a city. <laughs> <laughs> All in one port. Yeah. So that's that, this is the kind of stuff where you. Next to us, they Needless to say, we weren't exactly prepared for us. <laughs> We just went back from here. So we we found some interesting things. Here's our, our military equipment was focused on anything that was pre-identified. So if it wasn't a chemical agent for weaponized, we didn't have anything to deal with it. I had to get commercial stuff off the shelf. But it works. But we had to learn about it, and then we realized there's no there's none of the stuff we build in, which is communications and you know, links to it and alarms. And we had to have a guy, we had this poor kid in a chaise lounge. Out there to make this to make the detector work. Sure on the other the detector, because it's only the small and portable. Like detector's only the detector's only like this. Big. So was it like easy to pick up? Yeah, that's really. Well, at least I got to relax for the day. Fast relax today didn't do much like work. Well, you got to relax while being on edge. Yeah, you had a boss. The kid said it was less boring than being in the hangar. You know, because we were stuck at the airport. They wouldn't let us off, so we were hanging out in the hangar. And he says, you know, his buddies were noisy. He got out to be quiet and read his books and had a good time. <laughs> so we also we also found out as you guys found out you need everybody involved in order to get anything solved because we could not have solved that problem that he wasn't listening to the United States 
So we had to go back through all the way through the United Nations through that chain to actually get the people on the ground that could stop this problem from the, the toxic release of stuff. And it's you know it, it's about access to this group. There's about thirty thousand people in mud, still there in the mud north of Cross. Uh, one of the things you did when you walked around is we got some people out because they would have a hand or an arm sticking. So about two weeks into this, there's nothing like a hand that's been dead for two weeks sticking out of the mud. The body attached to it, it gets a little nasty. And the real lesson was, all plans become obsolete at the moment of execution. That's a military truism. I think that, that actually, one of Napoleon's staff pointed that out. It's just your, your plans don't actually work. So that's, that's what happens when you go and you make a nice plan and you come in to do something and you get involved in multiple countries, you end up having to be flexible. And you also end up learning something about what it is you're, you're actually responding to the crisis with. It was kind of a, it was kind of a neat lesson. Um, not that dissimilar from, since we've got a couple of minutes, from the problem of when Hurricane Mitch destroyed Central America. Uh, Neca, Iowa was hurt probably the largest of all. It really had a tremendous amount of damage. And they lost 90% of their hospital beds. Uh, most of their hospitals were built at bends in the river that the water just came slushing down the river and washed the hospitals away. I, I actually went to one mobile hospital. That was a 50-bed 50 <laughs> 50 adobe, sort of 50-bed like hospital. Ambulance. And there was one room in the middle of these walls about this high, all these broken walls. There was one little, one of these little cubicles that had a metal bed and a metal nightstand still stand, just still there. And just the rest of the place is gone. It was amazing. So, being able to say Nicaragua at that, at this point in time, because it was 1998 at that point, and Nicaragua was not very happy with us because we just finished the Iran Contra thing. And we had, we had been involved in their civil war against Danny Ortega, uh, and U.S. people were excluded from Nicaragua at, at that point. And they needed help badly, and we had most of the help. The Cuban brigade came and helped them, and they realized how many Cubans there were in a brigade, and, and they knew they needed more help. Right, we, you guys are bigger than a Cuban brigade. We should be the Cuban brigade next day. Uh, exactly. Cuban brigade. brigade. <laughs> Cuban brigade plus three. And so I, it, it was it, it was kind of interesting. I had had a, a I had an international medical meeting in Miami. We're talking about yellow fever coming back out of the Amazon. And the Minister of Health from Nicaragua was the person I invited to speak. Just because he was a nice guy. And I had him speak at this meeting, and this was about six, eight months later. He went to Danny Ortega and convinced him that I needed to come and help Nicaragua rebuild his, his medical stuff because he knew me. Danny said yes, and so I became the first active duty military officer to show up in Nicaragua since the Contras. Uh, and it was really neat flying. And flying in Nicaragua, I'm just you know, the airplane and go, wow, I'm in Nicaragua, I'm in Nicaragua, in Nicaragua. But that's, everything was gone. It was a, absolutely incredible. But we got something done as the U.S. We built them, we, we built about 15 hospitals for them as in the next year in Nicaragua. And that changed U.S.-Nicaraguan relations. We're still connected. Still. But in the, uh, just before I went down there, I got a call in my, my home. I was stationed in Miami. That's where the headquarters for this is. I had a call at 10 o'clock at night on my phone. Is this Dr. Mitchell? Yes. This is Jimmy Carter. Boy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like, what idiot is <laughs> Somebody is playing with me. I don't like this. You know, I've, I've got like, all this all this stuff to plan, and I've been busy. And I don't need to do this. He said, no, this is Jimmy Carter. <laughs> and he went, yes. He said, well, I need your help. And he said, I'm in Managua. He was already there. And he said, there's no water. The, water's, the water treatment plants have all been damaged. He wants all of the iodine tablets in the U.S. inventory to be flown to Nicaragua to sterilize the water. 
to avoid all these outbreaks. And I said, sir, you were a Boy Scout, weren't you? I said, you know, the iodine tablets really suck. They're, they just make the worst part. I don't know how many of you guys have ever tried an iodine tablet in water. It's the old, in the old days, Boy Scouts, you, really, you always did that. Just, just to torture yourself. <laughs> it's just horrible. It's horrible stuff. So I said, I, I, I really don't think they're going to use it. Uh, doctor, I'm asking you for the iodine tablets. I said, uh, sir, <laughs> you don't tell a former president no. So I got a, uh, there were 125,000 cases of ionite tablets in the U.S. inventory for post-nuclear war, which is getting more relevant all the time. And I sent 100,000 cases on the DHL, which was the only carrier flying because the air was, it was still perfect. And it, it was really neat. I was about to, in those couple of days that we were getting ready, about 48 hours later, I get a call. So, uh, Dr. Mitchell, this is President Conger. Yes, sir. Uh, they won't drink the water. <laughs> <laughs> I told you, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> I'll send sugar tablets. <laughs> it was like, yes, sir. You, you weren't a very good president either. <laughs> <laughs> I felt like oh, I, I remember the fuel shortages. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, he said, what can we do? And I said, well, we, we could we could use pool chlorine. Because pool chlorine actually works. I mean, just you just don't put as much in as you put in your pool, but you you can use oh, that. Wow, the pool tastes too bad. And we said, well, we, <laughs> we need that for a hundred thousand people. <laughs> so, okay. So I called the folks at HTH, which is the biggest pool manufacturer of chemicals, pool chemicals, and they only had fifty gallon drums, which was really not, which you know you can't really use that in households. You can't really, you can't do much with a fifty gallon drum and that stuff. So I explained the problem. On a Friday afternoon, these folks at HDH, and, and they were in Tennessee. They were down the road from the, from the FedEx hub. And they stayed all weekend with baggies and put all those, put over 100,000 doses for a five gallon can into baggies and sealed them up from these 50 gallon drums put them in boxes, and they loaded them in FedEx and took them on Monday mornings, and they got out of them. Wow. <laughs> they never got recognized for that. That's dedication. Uh, that's I would. Isn't that amazing? Government. Those people all stayed. They stayed for the weekend, slept on the floor, and just packaged this. No recognition. They got no recognition. But they came in the That's just annoying. <laughs> So but they got people. But that Cuban brigade, Cuban brigade though. <laughs> but the Cuban brigade got yeah. Yeah. Well, you know. So I, it, but that's one, one of the things you do. You have to be inventive so you can get that stuff done. I mean, there are people who will, there are people who will help. It's all. You know, it, it's not all because it's in warehouses. But that was kind of neat when we did that. So that got that, that prevented a whole bunch of problems in the guard where there were really no outbreaks. I thought that was really pretty good. What else you want to know about this stuff? Because you learned that you guys were learning. Yeah. Are you going to help? Would I don't know if, how much you two have talked or you guys have talked in general, um, but are you willing to help with this course, like say next semester or next year, or help set it up, not do anything, just guest speak? What? Well, if you remember, the military is taught from day one, there's never volunteer for anything. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you volunteered for my plagiarism. Yeah, I know. I can't believe that. I, anyway, there's a committee. <laughs> yeah. Well, wait, yeah. wait, what about those graduates? What's going to happen to them? <laughs> That's what the plagiarism committee's for. <laughs> <laughs> Are they actually going to get canned? So, yeah. yeah, they do. I've been oh. asked if I would participate as this course gets completed and potentially so do, a do a little play next year. Sure. They do nothing but play plagiarize. Jackson, no. make it really fun. Well, so the worst one is that I want to be more fun of this. <laughs> actually, it is. Well, I'll tell you one more story. Because I have three more minutes. So I'll tell you one more story. In, in my game, okay, in the Army, you know, at the War College down here in Carlisle, and in the Army, you actually play this like just like you guys did, except you play for two weeks. It's just two weeks all day, you know, all day for two weeks. And so I was playing, and, and I, I, for at one point, I was the chair, vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. <laughs> you rotate jobs, three jobs in two weeks. So I, the hardest job I had was was Spicer's job. I, I was actually the PA guy. Oh, I was. Yeah, 
That was horrible. The press secretary was awful. Well, it can't be worse than the White House. Guy. Well, no, but they had actual Washington reporters came up to play. Well, 